you for a second. I'm sorry. Okay, Nico has started the recording. All right. Sorry. All right. Should I go back? Yeah, if you can. Okay. Sorry. So we're going to talk about fetal malformations associated with a virus called Cache Valley virus. But I need to start with some words that are commonly used in writing about the malformed lambs that this virus can cause. And they're big words. I tell the vet students that they spend four years learning words that they then have to translate back into English when they talk to their clients. The first of these big words is arthrogryposis. Arthro meaning joint. And it's a fusing of the joint of the lamb because the muscles have contracted in a such way that the joint doesn't bend properly. Hydrocephalus, you may have heard about relative to puppies or even human babies where fluid accumulates in the brain. Hydranencephaly is a more serious version of that where the upper part of the brain, the cerebral hemispheres are replaced by sacs of fluid which is cerebral spinal fluid, but it's, there should have been brain there instead. Finally, there are some terms for abnormal bending of the backbone. Scoliosis is sideways. Uh, you may have known young people that had scoliosis and the school nurse checked for that, make sure they had a straight spine instead of scoliosis. And kyphosis, <laughs> is an outward curve to the bone or a hunched back. And these are all things that Cache Valley can do to the lamb. And this is what the lambs can look like. So when you've got lambs whose legs and backbones are fixed in these abnormal positions, often there's a difficult birth or a dystocia just because the, the lambs don't uh, get in the normal position to be born. And this is a lamb that has hydranencephaly, uh, where there's very little brain tissue left, and that was full of fluid and has collapsed. The top has been cut off the skull in this lamb to expose uh, the abnormal brain. So Cache Valley virus is named for a valley in Utah and Idaho. And this is a place where the early trappers, trapping mostly beaver, hid their trading goods. They couldn't cart it around with them every day. So they hid what they'd collected so far at some place in Cache Valley. And it was in this valley that uh, the virus was first isolated in 1956 and wasn't really known much about what it did. Then in 1987, uh, workers in Texas saw malformed lambs and they published the first paper in 1989. We've learned quite a bit about the virus since 1989. We know, for instance, that it readily infects deer, also cattle and horses. But there don't seem to really be any reports in this country of Cache Valley virus causing birth defects or malformed fetuses in the deer or the cattle or the horses. But when blood samples are taken from these species, we can see that they have had a, a serologic to response to an infection. Human cases occur rarely but there seems to be no spread from one person to another person. So Cache Valley virus is one of a number of orthobunya viruses. And there are two quite famous ones out there in the world literature. Akabani came first, well-described in Australia and in Asia. And then much more recently, Schmalenberg virus was identified in Germany. 
and it was worked out that these were caused by bunya viruses and that uh, the viruses were spread by mosquitoes. There are some gnats or midges called culicoides that may play some part, but for all these viruses, mosquitoes get the major blame. The Akabani and Schmallenberg viruses affect cattle. And so cases show up in cattle. And uh, as I said, we haven't really seen that in this country with Cache Valley virus. So the viruses cross the placenta of sheep and goats at 30 to 40 days of pregnancy. And once they've gotten into the fetus, cross the placenta and get into the fetus at that stage, they can cause abortions or death, um, where it doesn't get expelled, but it may turn into a mummy, or um, stillbirths or uh, abnormal lambs or kids at delivery. And those lambs and kids can have arthrocryptosis hydrocephalus, hydranencephaly, and various malformations to the spine. Now to diagnose these virus infections, by the time the lambs are delivered, the cause their dystocia or just delivered as an abortion, the virus is no longer present. So we cannot grow the virus from the fetuses. But instead, it's very common to use a blood test for antibodies in the fetus and the mother to make the diagnosis. Now, if we find the antibodies in the fetus, that is proof that the fetus was infected. If we find it in the mother, the mother has been infected at some time, but that does not prove that these malformed lambs were caused by this virus because she can keep a positive blood test for several years. So it's much more convincing to find the test result in the fetus. Now we've seen Cache Valley before and traditionally we saw it in the January lambing in the Cornell flock. And for lambing in early January, they would have been 30 days pregnant in early September. Now the Cornell lambs, well, the Cornell sheep were managed on something called the star system of accelerated lambing, where there were five lambing periods a year, each separated by 73 days. And the next lambing was in March. We didn't see Cache Valley in March, traditionally, in the Cornell flocks. Why? Because the mosquitoes that spread the virus had been killed off by frost by early November. And I'm afraid that global warming has changed this. We didn't get a frost till very recently. And therefore, um, those lambs could be infected later on just because the frost does not come as early. Certainly isn't coming dependably in October any longer. And this all comes into the story. So this is a lamb born last year on February 1st in Newark Valley. And you can see that the legs don't look good and there's, I don't know if my, there's a kink in the backbone there. Well, I have the privilege of having access to a radiograph machine. And I don't take x-rays, I take radiographs, which is the picture that the x-ray makes. But this is that lamb from Newark Valley with a radiograph taken. And you can see that these legs, I couldn't straighten them out anymore for the radiograph. And this is one front leg that goes back along the body and a back leg that comes forward 
and look at the S-shaped curves in its backbone. Also, you might notice that the lower jaw is short. These white dense things are teeth. There should be no mm -hmm. teeth on the upper jaw of a lamb, but they, uh, the lower ones should come out to about here. So it had a short lower jaw. This was a lamb delivered in Ithaca, the beginning of March last year. And these legs certainly aren't normal and the neck did not straighten. So some more radiographs uh, showing uh, all this bend in the neck, we could not correct. So this was one of those short jaws or parrot mouths. It was born in February of last year in Ithaca. And it was uh, delivered alive. And it was actually a pretty viable lamb because it figured out how to nurse its mother. So it went along until weaning time. And then it didn't do very well trying to eat solid feed because uh, the lips didn't come together and the jaw was too short. So that one ended up being euthanized. Well, the first time I gave a talk about Cache Valley, it was to prevent an outbreak in, present an outbreak in goats to an international uh, sheep meeting in England in 2017. And I reported on an outbreak that we had in the Ithaca area in uh, 2015. And it was an established herd of mostly boar goats. They had one purchase buck and I had 31 boar and boar cross does. And in November and December of 2015, there were three unexplained abortions. I turned in samples to the diagnostic lab. They did all their regular tests. So there was no toxoplasmosis, no chlamydiosis, no leptospirosis, no Q fever. I had asked for tests for Cache Valley, but the pathologist is noted for not reading the request from the clinicians and blood was not saved from the fetus. So we had no way to prove Cache Valley because we did not have the fetal fluid to test. <laughs> then we came to Christmas Eve. And I was in Boston, but I got an email on Christmas Day describing the event where this goat kid presented backwards and the owner could feel a tail and four feet. And she just could not push one kid out of the way. So she called her neighbor for help. And the neighbor, uh, probably knowing less about what can go wrong on a dystocia, just pulled and pulled the kid in this position and it came out. And the mother survived with no real damage done. Um, there are 2.2 pounds in a kilogram. So it was about a six pound goat kid. And all of these legs were fused in these abnormal positions. And the hind legs were terribly short. They ended there. And the front legs were a normal length and went much further. And there was the bend in the backbone you can see in this radiograph. And there was fluid replacing the brain. And the kid was male. And it also was a crypt orchid. So the testicles were inside. And this is another birth defect that has been associated with Cache Valley. But you got to look a little closer. If you look at the radiograph, uh, this is a hip joint and a femur, and that's all the hind leg that came out. So that was Christmas Eve, and Christmas didn't get any better. Um, there were twins delivered on Christmas, and they had these fused joints and kinked necks and the hind legs. This would normally have been the hock and the toes would have started down here. And this one foot 
didn't get as far as any toes. The other foot was a little longer. Big bad kink in the neck. Uh, it had the fluid on the brain and uh, not a good sign. And its twin was a little bigger and was delivered alive. It had a head tilt. It had eyeballs that flickered up and down, indicating a neurologic problem. It had a mild twist to its neck. Uh, boy, I got to go back to where he was. It had kind of messed up vertebrae here that weren't completely attached to the skull and a lot of fluid where the brain should have been. It wasn't a very smart lamb because it did not have most of its brain. So it didn't have a good prognosis even if the owner had tried to nurse it along. On December 28th, there were twins born and um, one of these had flippers in place of uh, feet and it had the fluid on the brain. It also had a hole in the heart. So very messed up lamb. And the other one, female, and it had a really severely kinked backbone. You notice that the head's twisted all the way around, the fused joints and the fluid on the brain. And then the last one was born in early January and it was a bigger male, but it presented just like the very first one with four legs coming at the same time because the front legs were out along the body. And uh, this is what it had for a brain. And by comparison, this is the brain, the cerebrum and the cerebellum of a normal goat kid. So we suspected Cache Valley. And by the time I got back from visiting my daughter in Boston, all of these kids had been frozen. We thawed them out, we radiographed them, and we tested them. We also tested the mother. And we found antibodies to the Cache Valley virus group of viruses in the mother's blood and in the blood or thoracic fluid of the kids. We went back to two of the does that had aborted in the late fall with normal looking but premature goat kids and they had antibodies so they were infected at some time but you would never have guessed that um, the abortion was caused by cash valley and the lab hadn't tested for it. The lab did test for other viruses that can cause these birth defects. The Schmallenberg virus uh, from Europe, we were screening to see if that virus had gotten to our country. Blue tongue virus, which is common in the West, but not here, and bovine virus, diarrhea virus, they were all ruled out. So this was some serology or blood tests that were done, and um, the does in this column had high titers and the kids did have titers. And I wrote at the bottom in case you wanna talk this over with your veterinarian, that we can get fluid from around the lungs of the fetus. They don't have to look at the little tiny heart of a four pound goat kid and try to get enough fluid out of it for a lab test. You can just suck up the clear fluid from the chest in a syringe and turn it into the lab. So why did we have this outbreak? Uh, well, back in 2017, we found some information from the New York State Department of Health. The Department of Health monitors mosquito pools every fall for virus activity. There's an arbovirus lab and they um, collect mosquitoes and see what viruses are in them. In 2014, there was no Cache Valley virus whatsoever detected. In 2015, they had 67 positive mosquito pools. In 2016, there was none. So in the fall of 2015, there was a lot of this virus activity and that's when the goat kids got infected. Those mosquito pools were tested for other viruses 
that have names that I didn't write out, like Jamestown Canyon virus um, or Potosi virus. And the lab checks for all these viruses every year. So just last weekend, I found data for 17 years, basically, for the viruses. And green is the color of the Cache Valley virus. So in 2003, there was a lot. There wasn't any in 2004. And here we didn't have any in 14. We didn't have any in 16. But there was a lot in 15 and in 17. You don't care so much about 2020 when there was some because that's history. What matters is what was the virus doing this year? So Sunday, I emailed the Wadsworth lab, the arbovirus, and said, what can you tell me in a preliminary fashion that you don't have in your website about Cache Valley virus in 2021? Yesterday, I'd gotten no answer, so I sent the same email again. And today, I got an answer, which I think uh, the grad student in Canada will be quite interested in because uh, these folks, uh, Dr. Ciotta is actively studying Cache Valley virus. He's had 12 positive mosquito pools this year. And he thinks that's pretty average for how many they get. But he said that more importantly, there have been two human cases of Cache Valley virus with neurologic disease. And this is pretty unique. I know of two other cases in the literature, in the older literature. And they are writing a paper on this. And they've looked at how there's been more Cache Valley activity um, since 2010. And they think it's because there's a new strain of the virus that's more easily spread by mosquitoes. So the virus has been around, but the mosquitoes can spread this new strain more easily to bite the sheep or the people and cause the infection. So it'll be interesting to see his paper when it comes out. So this is my summary of the case. I know I've gone a little over time. That goats as well as sheep can be infected. It's been mostly reported in sheep. That it's transmitted mostly by mosquitoes. It causes birth defects. It's across most of North America. And white-tailed deer can be a host. We know there are more white-tailed deer than we need to be hosts. We're not sure that those white tails are uh, ever getting birth defects themselves. But if you've uh, watched the deer running in front of your car lately, this is the breeding season now for deer. So they should not have 30 day pregnancies when their mosquitoes out. And that may be why deer don't show the birth defects. Your best way to avoid this is to delay breeding until the end of the vector season. But who was going to guess that the frost would be so very late this year? Some of you may have lambs in the incubator that uh, had reached 30 days by uh, before the frost happened. And if you get any of these birth defects, I'd appreciate reports, photographs, and the like. It may or may not be worthwhile to you and your veterinarian to submit samples to the lab, but certainly it would be very interesting to keep track of the birth defects that occur. And uh, Dr. Dubovi, Dr. Belinda Thompson helped a lot with the paper and for the 2017 talk. Those two students wrote a paper that I've never quite gotten published, and Ag and Markets paid for a lot of testing on uh, food and fiber animals. So, does anybody have a question? Ask it out loud, please. This is Melanie Barkley with Penn State Extension. Do you want me to um, solicit folks to, to uh, get in contact with me if they see lambs with Cache Valley virus? 
I'd love Amen. it if, if you could get the breeding date, the birth date, uh, what the lamb looked like and what his lower jaw was like and was it a crypt orchid. They're great fun to dissect if somebody wants to do extension programs. Okay. <laughs> Make sure um, kids wear gloves. All right. And, Can you and Melanie be sure to include goats as well? Okay. Can you send me all the information or email me all the information we'd want to collect? Okay. And uh, I can if even you'll send me an email. I can send you back. Okay. The email. I was going to say Ta Tatiana has my email. Okay, Tat, you are now trusted to send me an email. All right, I will I'll send it to you also. Do that. And this could be shared with the person in Canada who's collecting uh, producer reports. And I don't know what she's looking for. Okay. Is she on this Zoom? I am. Ah, hi. What would you like to know? Yes. Well, um, first. Thank you so much for including me. I'm ecstatic to be included. And secretly, I'm American that grew up just outside New York City. So uh, it's great <laughs> to talk to other Americans. Um, but that's actually really fascinating results that you shared from your colleague at the Arbovirus Lab, because those are very high numbers, considering a lot of the literature that I've gone through in terms of like Connecticut, for example, there's a group there that does tons of arbovirus testing. And if you look at the number of pools that are positive for any of the orthobunny viruses relative to how many they've tested, the percentage is much, much lower. Um, so I would definitely intend to follow up with that. I think the, in summary, the questions that you raised to collect are on point. The only other things I would ask about was the age of the dams just out of okay. curiosity, because sometimes they're actually quite a bit older and it really just um, goes back to the breeding schedule that the producers practice, because that can change on occasion. And then if you can get it, the, the housing per season. But I've learned from my field sampling this summer that they can be really difficult because they can move multiple times in a day and multiple times in a season. So really it's when are they being bred? Because as you said, the high risk is really mid July actually to late September. Um, and then we would expect to see this disease. So I was surprised to see it so late that you reported on. And I did have one question. I don't know if you've come across, you know, there's not much mention of what happens prior to about 30 days gestation. And I'm guessing it's just hard to control for that type of testing experimentally, but I assumed it was probably resulting in abortions that just aren't being detected. I, I think the, the thought is that uh, many of these will just die, come back into heat, whatever. Okay, we yeah. do expect the mother to have some immunity the next time and not abort the next year with yes. this virus. Yes. I would agree with that. Okay, I don't wanna hog the stage, I could go on forever, so <laughs> thank you. So Mary, the, the, the other group that would be at high risk would be if you're doing out of season breeding in, in June, right? That would, that would cut into the, those, those goat kids or lambs being 30 days gestation um, in July when, when the mosquitoes would be well would be starting to be around or not really. In fact, the arbovirus people don't even really start looking till July because the viruses seem to build up more later in the year. So I don't think that July is a particularly dangerous time. But um, I hadn't really seen it except in the star system breedings before, or else we didn't recognize it. Certainly, plain abortions, I would never have ascribed to this without the birth defects. We um, definitely had two last January. 
Um, we have about a 60 count dairy herd, goat dairy herd. We breed for January. We breed starting August 1st. And I had two dystocias that we delivered with the exact description that you had, Dr. Smith. Okay. It's, it's almost better if a veterinarian isn't involved because the veterinarian is going to say this has to have a C-section and you're going to say you cannot afford a C-section. And sometimes you can get them out. Often it's a matter of breaking the legs of the lamb. It was challenging, no doubt. <laughs> but um, one of my to-do list was how do I send um, a fetus in for uh, a dystocia birth in for sampling? Do I need to freeze it? Do I send it to Cornell? This is information I don't have. Well, you need to work through your veterinarian. Oh, she's on. The, she's on the call, Dr. Ashworth. The, the diagnostic lab only takes samples from veterinarians. Okay. And as a food and fiber animal, it, the individual fetus, they're not only going to do one at a time, I think, but you can submit it along with placenta, very important for finding other causes of abortion. Of course. Um, I had wondered if it was poison, eating, eating plants that were high in poison maybe in the late fall. That was my other- I don't one. think you're gonna find those plants in our part of the world. Okay. And I teach the poisonous plants course. Okay. So I, I'm not out there looking for plants. Um, we might get some blue tongue virus. It pops up every now and then in the Northeast. Um, or if you just want to prove this one, your, your vet could take a sample of that fluid from the chest of the lamb, submit that, okay, and uh, then save the rest frozen against possible desire to do something more later. But you need to check with what the lab fees are next year. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. And Mary, you mentioned um, you mentioned being a food and fiber animal, and I know that at times you can get discounts from the state when you're sub submitting animals for necropsy. Um, what what are the general rules for that? It has to be not a pet sheep or pet goat, but something that is being used that Ag and Market thinks is a reasonable food or fiber use. And then the veterinarian has to fill out a very detailed history, including how many animals on the farm and how many affected and when it all started and has any other, so there's a lot of history that goes into it to get the discount, but it's an appreciable discount. And you can get all the abortion testing done for much, much less than if you were out of state. If you're Pennsylvania, sorry, you can't send them up here and get the discount. See what you can get out of Penn State. <laughs> and on ha handling those dystocias, um, what recommendations do you have? I mean, it sounds mostly like just grit your teeth and lubricate and pull. Um, well, as I say, if it's twisted legs and you can break the leg, which isn't that hard to do. Many of you have had the occasion to step on a bottle lamb without meaning to, the leg breaks. So you, if you can straighten out the leg that way, maybe it would help if you lifted up the hind end of the U so the lamb fell back more into the birth canal. A veterinarian can give an epidural. A C-section can be done, but I do know that they are expensive and you can't all, if you've got a commercial herd, you may not be paying as much as if it's a 4-H uh, show goat and there's a very emotional teenager attached. But lots and lots of lube and pain medication afterwards and euthanize if something tore inside. It's always nice to do the C-section, but I know it can't always happen. And that woman got up through all of those, losing none of those does.
Any any other questions for Mary? Um, I don't have a question, but I just want to say that I have clients who are far away. So sometimes I'll tell them, send the lamb or whatever the animal is to Cornell, give me a call, and then I can email the form. Yes. When time's a, a essential, then just go ahead and pack it, get up there. Don't wait for me. And where are you located, Elena? I'm Southern New York, near Poughkeepsie. Near Poughkeepsie, good. Um, are you looking for more sheep and goat clients? <laughs> I'm overwhelmed like everybody else. Okay. I need an associate. Send one of your students to me. Right. And we have a question in the chat as to wh whether there's any chance that a vaccine is being worked on. I don't think so. If it was a major problem for humans, and set it two cases in the past and two cases recently, maybe. But this isn't that the human threat that COVID is. However, you might notice in the news that the COVID virus is being found in deer. And there are a lot of deer around and we don't know if those deer are spreading COVID. And certainly they're not spitting in your face or sharing your beer cup, but we they're getting infected somehow. So we don't know a lot about how these viruses spread around and uh, deer could be a more important vector in the future. Any other questions for Mary folks? Well, thank you for your attention. And actually, Mary, I'm going to ask you, is there any chance you could you could tell us a little bit about the New York State Sheep and Goat um, Health Assurance Program at all? I can say a little bit. Um, I'm hoping it'll get going again. So there is a program called Nice Chap, which is New York State Cattle Health Assurance. And the farm veterinarian and a state veterinarian and the farmer would sit down once a year and go over how the herd had performed in the last year, what was limiting production, what were the major goals, who needed to do what to meet those goals. And uh, there was no charge to the farmer for this. It was a great program and it got squashed by COVID because the state veterinarian was not going to those farms to meet. And I'm not aware that it's, but maybe I just haven't asked a state vet if they'll go out to do a, one of the couple of farms I have left. So we did get that going for sheep and goats also. So if you're in New York state, your veterinarian can uh, set this up so that you, you pull all your records together and you say, I had, 53 sheep and the lambing period got spread out over five months and 20% of the lambs died. You get all your problems together and then these people brainstorm on how to fix that and that you're gonna get your rams uh, uh, fertility tested before the breeding season so they get pregnant right off the bat and you're gonna vaccinate and all these other things. So it would be a good program to uh, get your veterinarian involved with. And many vets do not know that sheep and goats can be included and the vet gets paid for doing this. The farmer pays nothing, the vet gets paid and Ag and Markets in Albany fit, puts the bill. We did um, 27 flocks or uh, goat herds up our way over the last year and a few months as part of our Yoni's project. Okay, so you've so they are doing been able it. to do them even though we had COVID? Yep. Great. Outside. We just did stayed outside. <laughs> you might want to start in the spring. This is uh, Rich in Delaware County, and uh, we participated in Nice Cap for uh, several years. 2020, we did not get a visit, but in 2021, we did. Okay. Uh, so they are going back out on the farms. My problem is my dairy herds are basically closed up. I, 
the family farms are leaving this area. Um, Mary, we had one question on, is a frost necessary to keep the mosquitoes away or should the temperature simply be under a certain uh, temperature? Well, I know I have mosquitoes in my house and my house drops to 48 every night and those mosquitoes are out trying to bite me when I'm playing my horn the next day. So they may be not actively chasing you on a cold day, but I don't think it's going to kill them. And then you get a warm spell. And we have another question of how to get involved with a nice cap. Um, so would they talk to the Animal Health Division of Ag and Markets, or would they talk to the Cornell Vet Diagnostic Lab? So there is a website, and if you just search that, you'll find contact information, N-Y-S-C-H-A-P. And the sheep and goat part's a little bit buried in that. So it's my understanding, this is Rich uh, in Delaware County, is that uh, ideally you first talk with your, your own vet and ask them that you wanna participate. And if they are aware of the program, they typically can get you started. At least that's how it works here in Delaware County. And uh, if they're not familiar with it, you can contact a state vet for your area. Who would be the one coming to the farm? They both come, to, they come to, they both show up. The yes. state yeah, they come together. Yeah. Well, they come separately, but it's right. a meeting between farmer, your, your local vet and the state vet. Um, and I know I've, I've been in situations where um, I've been working with a farmer who can't, or a goat dairy who, who can't find a local vet, and the state vet has actually helped to reach out and find, find a vet who's, who's willing to participate in the program uh, with them. Um, you know, sometimes in eastern New York, it can be, uh, southeastern New York, it can be hard to find a vet who works with um, with sheep and goats, and um, and and I found that in at least one case it was helpful. Um, um, Michelle uh, Bergevin from uh, Guelph is saying that regarding the temperature question, it's important to note that mosquitoes that carry Cache Valley virus can overwinter and pass the virus to offspring, but within offspring populations, the virus levels are low and need time to mount sufficient levels to infect. Hence, you don't have the high risk until late summer. And also a slight tangent, but for those breeding in late August, September, if first time lammers have been exposed to one full summer and early fall prior to first breeding, it increases the chance of exposure to Cache Valley virus and establishes antibodies which will protect any future pregnancies from cash valley fever. And I guess, Mary, that was, that was one thing. Um, I take it that they do feel that ewes and um, goat, those that have, developed, that have developed antibodies from prior in exposure are going to be protected for at least a few years from having uh, deformed lambs and kids. I don't know of any experimental evidence for that but it's the common belief. Michelle? Yeah, I agree. Um, so this summer I was sampling flocks all over Southern Ontario. I, I was able to make it to 18 farms and I sampled mature ewes. They varied in age, but they basically had to have been on the farm at least one full summer and fall. So the youngest were two and the oldest were as old as 14, um, just trying to get a sense of exposure and then collect history. So um, I'm sifting through that data, although I will mention that 89% of the flocks were seropositive, 16 out of the 18, and only half of those had reported knowing history of Cache Valley. Um, so to your point, it's pretty hard to definitively prove this through experiments, but 
um, evidence is mounting that suggests that the immunity lasts a fairly long time, um, likely the lifetime of a, a sheep or goat. Okay. Well, Mary, th thank you so much for doing this um, with us. And um, um, if people do have animals that have fetuses that they suspect have have this, um, would it be best for them to contact me or if they're in Pennsylvania, Melanie, to arrange? That, to that sounds good. Won't get lost then, my email. Okay. And then we can get in touch with you about what the steps are, or at least advise them to contact the vet diagnostic lab. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Mary. you. Um, and then if we want to go ahead and start into our breakout rooms, we can start stop recording. I don't know. We have about 20 people on. And so I don't know if we want to go into breakout rooms or meet together. Uh, Agnes, Nico.